Hi, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Chloe Appleby, an assistant curator working at the Powerhouse Museum, a contemporary applied arts and sciences museum based in Sydney. Ooh. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to assume that applause was for me. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the ancestral homelands upon which we gather today, the Wurundjeri people. We respect their elders past and present and recognise their continuous connection to country. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, you all may be thinking, where's the other red-headed curator that talks along with you? Um, unfortunately, Ginny Maxwell sends their apologies and but still recommends for you to continue reaching out to them in relation to museums and video games. Thank you so much for coming to a museum talk at a games conference. Uh, that means that you are all better than everybody else. <laughs> so during this presentation, I'm going to give you a crash course on museums, how they interact with games, and how communities and museums can work together to collaborate, exhibit, and preserve. Prior to delving into how we can support video games in cultural institutions, we first must go through what is a museum and the role of a curator. So what is a museum? Museums have dramatically changed from the, from the traditional old white guy dictating knowledge to board visitors to an inclusive, accessible and welcoming space for all members of the public. This is due to museums needing to change to suit the needs of evolving visitor values that have redefined the role. This is heavily emphasised in the updated definition of what a museum is. That they are not only to collect and conserve, but they're open to the public and offer very experiences for education, enjoyment, reflection and knowledge sharing. Museums are also non-commercial and public facing, which makes them different to galleries that are often privately funded and a focus exclusively on artists. Some of you are also probably wondering, what is the role of a curator? At a rudimentary level, the museum curator is responsible for collecting, preserving, displaying, and interpreting objects. They must also actively be engaging with their corresponding communities and responding to ever-changing social and cultural needs and values. Engaging in video games is a great example of this, as it is a significant contemporary media which can connect to a younger audiences that often museums can't reach. So how can we work together? <laughs> in Australia, there are various institutions engaging with games. However, for just this presentation, I will be only speaking on the practices of the Powerhouse Museum, which is collecting, exhibiting, and preserving or programming around games for different contextual purposes. Powerhouse. Its Powerhouse Museum is a cultural institution based in Sydney that has been established since 1880. A leader in demonstrating the applied arts and sciences, our collection holds over 500,000 objects relating to technologies, fashion, design, science, engineering, and contemporary practice. As Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, games are the perfect embodiment of the two disciplines merging, so really, it's a no-brainer that they belong in a museum. Three key ways we can engage with industry is collecting, exhibiting, and programming. Let's examine collecting and the preservation of material first. For the powerhouse, our collecting focus with respect to games includes all aspects of design, historic significance, social significance, innovations in science, and artistic merits. Other institutions would have a set criteria as well. If you ever wanted to check if your game would suit, search for their collection policy. Also, this is part, um, an excerpt from our collection policy, which is available online, if you type in powerhouse collection policy. Collecting games is not a new phenomenon. It has been around since the late 80s. For example, the powerhouse collecting the Sega Master System in 1987. 
This area has been seen to be taken more seriously due to its cultural and contemporary media impact and rise in popularity. With Australians spending $4.21 billion in video games in 2022, and 81% of Australians have been reported to play games, cultural institutions cannot ignore the impact. Video game collecting or acquisition is a complex process that challenges the traditional collecting methods due to storage, interpretation, restrictions, copyright, and much, much more. I mentioned the term acquisition. It is not the same as a studio acquisition. Uh, here, it's a musicological term referring to items obtained by the museum for permanent collection through donation or purchasing. Once the cultural artifact is acquired, it is then held by the museum for the public. Digital artifacts are different as museums would hold a version of the original file for collection. Your game? A version for the museum, two different things. It is important to briefly discuss licensing here due to the phrases like holding and permanently in the collection potentially being anxiety inducing. Um, if you donate or a museum purchases a version of your game and corresponding archives, they have ownership of that material. However, you are the creator of your game uh, and you still own the intellectual property of the work. However, uh, you are, museums do not profit from the sales of the game, only you do. The powerhouse has a limited exclusive uh, copyright license in which you ask copyright holders to sign a royalty-free agreement for academic use in articles, exhibitions and databases, but it doesn't sign away the rights to your work. The powerhouse also has a deed of deposit in relation to indigenous cultural and intellectual property, where objects can be deposited for safekeeping, collaborated, collaborated on and respected outline usages, while the material remains with the traditional owners and will not be extinguished or transferred by the museum. Now, what do we want to actually acquire? We are looking for artifacts that tell the story of ideation, process, and release. It can be digital, physical, or both. It's better to show an example. Cultural institutions seek to not compete in relation to collecting, but rather to create a collaborative archive of material. This is so we can foster learning, access, and cover as much preservation as possible. As seen with the National Video Game Archive between ACME, the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia, also known as NFSA, and the Powerhouse, which came about all when we collected the same game, Florence, at the same time. Whoopsie. The first of this archive was a joint acquisition of Untitled Giz Game by House House. I'm so excited that was the first one that we picked. It's such a silly game. <laughs> it was selected due to its cultural impact, feats in design, including gameplay and art style, and the representation of thriving Australian independent games community. The goal of this archive was to ensure the game's playability continued. Therefore, collecting the commercial build of the game and pre-release bills was essential. Additionally, it was extremely important to document the development of the process of a game to ensure researchers could learn from their practice, as well as to assist curators present and future in displaying and interpreting the work. Here, concept art, storyboards, brainstorming documents, and the infamous Slack chat conversation were key to collect. So, for acquisitions, we are looking for material like, it's a long list, apologies, game builds, commercial releases, concept sketches, storyboarding, voice recordings, Slack chats, source code, sprite sheets, press kits, maps, merchandise, blender files, game engine files, I won't say Unity. Um, <laughs> and there's so much more that I can list, but that gives you an idea of what we're wanting to preserve. There's also material that we cannot acquire. So for example, as part of the acquisition of Untitled Goose Game, we couldn't acquire the source code, and that's due to copyright and ownership. Anything that is not owned by you, we cannot acquire as part of your game's acquisition. 
However, if you were inspired by movies, music, other games, we can have that on file as a research material. Additionally, on top of things that we cannot collect, if you want to approach a museum about getting your game in corresponding archival material acquired, but are concerned about source code or key art being accessed by the public, conditions and restrictions can be put in place. For example, you want to donate your concept art. Um, however, it's in a sketchbook, but you would prefer that you can hold on to the sketchbook. Also, you're not super proud of some drawings in there as well. In this case, creating digital scans with the museum is an option. These conditions and restrictions can also apply to exhibitions as well. Each institution has their own acquisition process. However, to be completely transparent, the acquisition process is long with many forms and with many people to approve it prior, before it goes into a collection. Please know that things can take months to years to do in a cultural institution, and it's very different to real world pacing. It is what Jeannie and I call human time versus museum time. Time moves much slower for us, but that doesn't mean that we move slowly. You also don't have to be a studio to be acquired. An example is the museum's acquisition of the browser game, browser game Gladdy Bird by Tyler Hamilton. The game is an 8-bit clone of Flappy Bird, but instead of a flapping bird, it's the former premier New South Wales Gladys Berejiklian prior to corruption, navigating through the coronavirus to collect vaccine vials. <laughs> it's free to play online. <laughs> it's purely a digital acquisition in which we collect collected the game files, sprite sheets, source codes, asset files, a readme and images of gameplay. The purpose of this collection was social significance during the COVID pandemic. Hamilton created an expression of frustration due to Sydney getting more vaccines, which ultimately turned into a way for people to come together through humour. Collecting games is important, not only to document game design and the way games are embedded into Australia's cultural fabric, but to preserve techniques, current methods of play, and stories for future generations. As NFSA's curator, Chris Arneal, shout out to Chris in the crowd, <laughs> states, digital culture, particularly games, are constantly at risk with servers going down, copyright issues, access to historical content, and corrupt files. A new study shows that in the US, 87% of classic games are critically endangered. In Australia, we've been emulating games since 2013 under the Play It Again project by Melanie Swalwell. So we're already doing better than the US. We're always doing better than the US. <laughs> so how can you help with preservation? Basically become hoarders. We want to be able to document as much as possible and having access to information effectively help us to do so. So everything you have when you're making a game, keep it. This also includes any historic material as well. You have old game magazines in the closet and you don't want them, we do. Uh, old, old consoles, great, we'll, we'll take those too. Uh, that little plastic bag where it's got all your cords in it and you might use the cord one day but then you don't actually end up using it. No, we do not want the bag. <laughs> That is the basics of collecting and preservation with some examples. So what happens next? This takes us to usage. How will my game be used? Museums use collection material in different capacities, namely for research, both internally and by the public, as well as exhibitions. It is important to note here that only less than 5% of a collection is ever on display and objects selected for exhibition must meet the required needs of the show. Exhibitions are extremely, con com exhibitions are extremely complicated to conceptualise, coordinate and design, and can take years to come into fruition. Remember, human time versus museum time. On top of this 
exhibition curation for games isn't fully conventionalised, which can disrupt the practice. The process of exhibition making is collecting, researching, conceptualising, object selection, contextualising in the show, arranging, displaying, designing, label making, building the set and installing. During an interview I conducted in June 2023 with pioneering playful curator Marie Folstein, she noted that games break the traditional modes of curation, as all aspects of creating an exhibition from concept, working with designers, object selection, etc., must be done at the same time in the beginning. Exhibiting games provides new opportunities for video game engagement that audiences would not normally expect from this medium. Video game or digital-based acquisitions exhibitions have been around for some time, with one of the earliest, the groundbreaking 1995 Virtualities Exhibition and Science Works in Melbourne. Curated by Peter Morse, it explored the extension of moving image into virtual spaces, which was a pivotal transition point for film and media cultures. The exhibition featured key artists, including Patricia, Patricia Pincicini and Felix Hood, creating games like creating game-like interfaces in their work. It showed the complexities of art and technology in an interactive space for audiences. Emery Folstein's exhibition, Design, Play, Disrupt, at the Victoria Albert Museum in England, 2019. She used cultural archives to convey practice. Over a four year period, developers were consulted on the design process of their games and installations were created that challenged original perspectives of video game audiences. Notably, the exhibition featured Journey by that game company. And here they expertly utilized notebooks, concept art and screenshots to convey the intended complex emotional responses of that game. And it was relatable to other fields in design industry and brought a sense of humanity behind the screen. These exhibitions and many more internationally challenged stigmas surrounding games and helps to elevate their status as a significant, as a significant cultural medium. I want to give an example of the process of creating an exhibition display so you understand what you'll be involved with. I'm just going to have a quick sip of water first. Mima, mima, mima. Um, the first video game display at the powerhouse since 2014 was Queer Man Peering Into a Rockpool.jpg by Fuzzy Ghost in the exhibition Absolutely Queer. The exhibition celebrates Sydney's leading queer creatives as part of Sydney World Pride in 2023. Working alongside a large curatorial team, we wanted to explore new ways of showcasing LGBTQIA plus content and stories through contemporary mediums. And of course, games were front and center. Particularly as an Australian product of LGBTQIA plus game content was extremely limited um, until 2012. An important aspect to consider was that the rest of the exhibition was not interactive. So I had to find a game that was also accessible for most audiences. That's when I remembered seeing a game about a queer man in rock pools during Lura Narakon, which fit perfectly as it was a walking sim about the titular character searching for his boyfriend in a vaporwave meets anime meets reality design style. Additionally, the selection of the indie title highlighted to audiences a different means of play using familiar Australian imagery like the Ibis and exposure beyond the usual AAA titles. The best part was that developers Pete and Scott were based in Sydney. The process of the design, the, the process of the display creation was all happening in tandem with uh, selecting the files for display. But let's start with the content first before I get into design. As a condition of part of the exhibition, 
was that the content display would have to be archived and into the collection. And that would also make up part of the display. I was very generously given over 100,000 files. <laughs> I see you, Pete. <laughs> um, consisting of, so all digital files consisting of stills, music, voices, uh, Blender files, Unity files, multiple game engines, con uh, con game versions, concept art, inspiration, imagery, and more. I had to determine in which lens I wanted audiences to view these files, which was in relation to LGBTQIA plus characters, their narratives, and their makers in games, particularly as they were not often visible to wider audiences. To best tell their story for use both in exhibition and archival purposes, a two-hour oral history with the developers was conducted and it outlined their history, game creation process and the public reception. This was extremely important to have as compared to other artists on display, it added a human element and another level of engagement with the game. Using clips from the recording, it would act as an audio guide to tie in all visual content for the display. Additionally, videos and images were sourced and sought permission from to enhance the story, including a clip from the music video, Daylight Matters by Kate LeBond, pictured here, as the inspiration for The Walk, a screen recording of their first ever interview by Games Hub and gameplay by streamer Viking Blonde. This served to enhance the creative process and the incredible reception the game received. The first iteration of the design in collaboration with Fuzzy Ghost was to feature the game playable on two screens, mimicking rock pools with content playing on the top screen on the right. This design effectively communicates the aesthetic and narrative of the game. However, one question that was plaguing me was could we tell their story effectively through this design? After some debate internally, working alongside designer Hugh O'Connor, we proposed a new design that featured digital archival material to make up the body of that display. A challenge I kept in mind was that the average visitor usually spends about 27 to 50 seconds at a display. So how do we showcase a digital archive? A display comprising of 20 screens it was designed, which featured GIFs of boyfriends kissing, reels of digital concept art, artistic screen recordings in Blender, photographs on holiday and inspiration imagery. As you can see, the screens were all different sizes, so I had to not only pick what told their story best, but what was aesthetically suitable. The three main screens in the middle of the display featured a short three minute film comprising of the oral history alongside archival material, gameplay and video of them winning an AGDA. This order was how the content was organized from right to left. So the, correct, the development pro, start, of their, start of their game, development process and reception. Right to left is unusual However, it didn't make sense to put the start of their story at the end of the visitor's experience of the game as they entered from the right-hand side. Another challenge of the display was, not, was knowing that not all visitors would be comfortable playing a game in a public setting or wanting to play at all. With this display, it was important to ensure their story and their intent through play, playing their game still came through without the actual need to play. This was part of my reasoning to include gameplay, characters, and fuzzy ghost stories and voices in the beginning. When you are collaborating on an exhibition with a cultural institution, nine times out of 10, we will ask you to create an exhibition-friendly version of your game. This is to avoid visitors from breaking the game, exiting the game, uh, going to a browser page, or just plain up breaking the device. We laugh, but this happens often, and you don't want an unattended kid realizing that they have access to the internet in a museum. Trust me. <laughs> the Queer Man Peering exhibition version limited player input to just only basic gameplay through two buttons and the analog sticks 
and the menu option showed only basic instructions to assist all audiences. The audience found a way to break it the next day. The display of queer men peering took eight months to conceptualise and realise, which is an outlier for the museum world. Often it takes years to create an exhibition and content is generally finalised a year prior to the opening. So if we reach out to you tomorrow in relation to an exhibition that's not opening until 2028, it's not because we want to mess with your schedule or that we are super organised. We're working on museum time. A fun fact for you guys to know, if you don't want to have your work featured in an exhibition, but, or if you do want to have your work featured in an exhibition, but you don't want to have it acquired, loans are another option. Anything that is displayed in an exhibition or has been brought in for research purposes must be documented. These are only for a short period of time and would have specific conditions surrounding the artefact. For example, it must be housed in a glass showcase. Something to flag is that you can't loan archival material to museums just for storage purposes and then want to take the objects back out for personal commercial use. So how do you get your game into an exhibition? That's a tricky question. <laughs> it really depends on the purpose of the exhibition is and what the curator is looking for. At a basic level, we're looking for games that can tell a story in relation to design and history while being informative to the public. Like if the focus is on animation, they might look for animators working in the space uh, or innovative techniques in games from animation. This is why it's important to make sure your game is known in local communities, as that is often the only way we can find out about your incredible work. Additionally, you can even contact curators about your game just to make them aware. Email or public social media platforms are the best way to do this. Curators are also expert researchers, which means we are expert stalkers. And if we really want to work with you, we will find a way. I consider myself an expert Twitter stalker. Compared to collecting and exhibiting, the most accessible way that you can get your video game into a museum is complementary and meaningful programming that goes beyond traditional interpretation. It allows us to engage with cultural artifacts more freely and to create specialised experiences that can showcase this contemporary medium in a niche setting. This includes curated events, workshops, drop-in activities, festivals and talk series. My role as a curator is to actively engage and respond to current climates. On top of design, social and historic representations, my secondary focus for engagement revolves around the need to support local developers, both in Sydney and wider Australia. I provide opportunities for recognition, development and feedback as these areas were previously neg neglected, particularly after the COVID lockdowns. I love a quote to back me up. Reaching out to Luke Lancaster, head of gaming for South by Southwest Sydney, he expressed that it's easy to look at Melbourne as the home of independent games in Australia, but that's what happens when you build an ecosystem of community, opportunity and support, both internally and externally. Let's examine the award-winning series, Powerhouse Lates, that celebrates a targeted local creative industry each Thursday night. The first Powerhouse Lates gaming was held on May 26 in 2022. I focused on celebrating games as a whole and putting on a fun and engaging night. It featured live music and gameplay for both in-person and streaming online audiences. During the ideas process, I was brought in as a games consult and included a talk series called Leveling Up, Australian games for the streamers to play and a retro game display and play area. With limited promotion, this event garnered a, surprise, garnered a surprising total of 500 people in person and 12,000 digital attendees. Based on feedback and reception of the event, it was obvious, obviously that uh, local audiences and works were missing. Professionals in attendance wanted these events for opportunities to put more games in front of the general audiences and public. 
and to get cultural support. The curation for the next three events was constructed to highlight and celebrate Australian-made games with a primary focus on Sydney communities. We achieved this through industry talks, both by established and emerging individuals, opportunities to network, particularly within the wider industry, and showcasing games at different levels of completion. The ultimate goal of these events was to form meaningful relationships with community and industry in relation to how we engage, engage with games to create further opportunities. Not only do the curators have to think of industry involvement, but also the general audience must be accommodated for. They must feel immersed and inspired to support local games. The showcases and talks had to appeal to all audiences and generate visitation by creating a balance of different levels of entry, gameplay, aesthetics, and notoriety. How did I select games? Um, I am professional, I promise. <laughs> well, I scoured social media, events, and conferences to find developers that will be willing to showcase their game. I know a lot of, the, a lot of you were sick of me by the end of last year, contact, constantly contacting you. As a means of keeping the barriers of entry as low as possible, if you wanted to showcase, there was no fee involved to do so. Any talks we held, we provided a speaker's fee that corresponded with the National Association for the Visual Arts Conditions, as well as accommodation and travel if necessary. This allowed us to provide the best support for the speaker and for the community. For the curation of these events, the defined themes and community climate became intertwined, striving to create meaningful experiences with studios and individuals through play. This is reflected in the continuously growing success of these four hour late night events, which have accumulated over 4,000 attendees across four occurrences. The lates are not a standalone occurrence. These types of events are also occurring at other institutions nationally, including the Acme X Work in Progress Nights and the Queensland Games Festival at the Brisbane Powerhouse. Brisbane Powerhouse has no relation to the Sydney Powerhouse. It is a clear cultural institutions recognise the need to support local games community through events to get as much exposure as possible. It is an exciting time for Australian museums. So many are engaging with games as a cultural artefact that you are spoiled for choice. If you want to get your game into a museum, there are ways to go about it. Collecting contemporary and historical Australian game artefacts help us to preserve for future generations and research. Exhibiting games allows us to communicate to wider audiences key messages and principles in game making and history, and in new ways to elevate the practice. Programs developed to support learning, networking and testing are beneficial to form meaningful connections with communities and audiences. Now that you know a bit more about our process and how we think, the best way to engage with curators is to reach out to them or to the museums they work for at least, if you can't get in contact directly. We're not scary, I promise. At least I'm fairly confident I'm not. I hope this has given you some insight into our mysterious ways of working. And if you have any questions or want to engage, please feel free to contact me. I also don't have a business card, so if you do want my email, please photograph it now. Um, thank you. <laughs>
future proofing it, we have to just con so we constantly we've got um, a emulation pro uh, program at the moment called Easy, where a lot of the museums and a lot of universities are coming together, and we're emulating old uh, technology through this. So our current for the museum at the powerhouse, our current project is floppy disks. So we're currently archiving floppy disks and their software as much as possible. Um, we just have to constantly be researching and be on different softwares and programs. This is, um, I wish my colleague Chris was here, he's better to answer that because he's a whiz at this. Um, but yeah, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of work and a lot of keeping up and research and um, having a lot of software available, but particularly emulation. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight into like the international community of games. I think in Australia, most of the museums have sort of gotten on to like, yeah, we can put games mm. in museums. Um, are you finding that Australia is a bit of an outlier in that respect or um, are other people on it as well? There are other people, museums on it. So there's a whole museum of play dedicated, or the museum dedicated to play called Strong over in the US. Um, that one is, it's more focused. The people in Australia, we're fo very focused on art, if that makes sense. You can kind of see it, whereas um, the strong is more focused on collecting physical materials. Like I know they collect a lot of um, game consoles and different types of like, like they got a whole bunch of Switch cartridges and that kind of thing. Um, but I feel, I feel like Australia is doing it very differently and in a good way where it's showing games off as a creative process and as an artistic, actual contemporary medium, which is fantastic. But um, I do feel like a lot of the museums overseas don't acknowledge that. Like with the um, Design Play Disrupt exhibition, that was pretty groundbreaking because it did show that design process. Um, there's also a lot of museums in China as well, uh, looking at that process as well. Got some fantastic curators over there. However, um, they have a lot of red tape to go through, but I feel like Australia is leading creatively for games. Yes. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what advice you would have for a game developer starting a new project. Uh, what kind of, like, how should they be recording and preserving um, yeah, everything that they're making. Bless you. Um, that's <laughs> that's the question I want to hear. Uh, <laughs> um, if you, uh, like, say, if you're drawing any concept art, got any paper or archival material, please keep that. You can even keep it in, another, like, a little manila folder. There's actually really no correct way to, say, to store your items except for just treat them nicely. Everyone would have their own system. Uh, for a digital file, I mean, it's our job to organise it, but if you do organise it into, like, different art styles or music or voice recordings, like, you can folder it away and then send it off, but that would make our life easier. But we'd, I'm not asking you to do that, but if you did do that, that'd be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, even a post-it note that you think is irrelevant in a few days' time might be really essential because it has the basic concept of your idea. It could be the start of your game. So just hoard, just hoard. Because then we go through it, that's our job. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Oh, I've got more questions, this is great. I was really nervous. <laughs> um, just to follow on from that, is it possible that we give you too much? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no no I don't think it's <laughs> no one, sorry Pete <laughs> um, look I don't think there's ever too much if you if you do have like say this is no shade to you Pete I'm so sorry it's no no yeah no no it's um like say if you have um like like material that is not yours we probably don't want but also a lot of personal material that you feel like is not relevant to the acquisition or, um, but no, honestly, I don't think you would ever give us too much. That's what the curator is for. We go through it and we determine what best tells your story. So if you do want to give us like heaps, like a big fat folder of stuff, that's fine. That's what we do. It's our job. Yeah, you're very welcome. Oh, 
Oh, sorry, there's, there's a microphone going around. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you'd ever curated VR games or narrative experiences or if you're open to that because I know some museums aren't. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm very open to it. Uh, we've actually... I haven't curated anything personally, but we did have the... Uh, it's an exhibition about Apollo moon landing and we did have a VR experience in that too and people were queuing up for like hours to just get involved with it. I think it is a cool way to experience, like say with the moon landing, you're, you're experiencing from the astronaut who was left behind instead of on the moon. Um, I, think, I think it's a really good opportunity to explore our educational purposes. So yes, I am open to it. We can also meet to match if you'd like to discuss it. Thanks, Chloe. Chris. That was fantastic. Oh, thank um, you, Chris. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on the future of sort of games exhibition design, and you mentioned the average attention span of a visitor being 30 seconds. Do you see it as your job to, you know, double or triple that time, or do you see it as your job to sort of like, you know, create palatable experiences that mm. can be, you know, experienced within 30 yeah. seconds, if you know? I think, I think a bit of both, eh? Hey? Games have this really cool, but also it's very detrimental experience where you can sit there for long and play games. I And it does keep you engaged just that little bit longer as well. I mean, people, are, when they come to the museum, they do want to experience these interactive opportunities as well. They don't want to come just see objects behind glass showcases. I mean, always, you, people touch things at the museum, so they do want to be tactile. So games could be a way that we go about it, that you could make an object in VR and then you can touch it that way. or when you do have an exhibition about the design process, maybe it's instead of I'm hoping I can get people past 50, 60 is great. If I can get them for 60 seconds. Um, I do think it is the job of the curator to make it engaging and worthwhile for the visitors. So we do have, we've got a long way to go because that's just, everyone's just, when they come to a museum, it's also depending on experiences. If I went to one, I do spend too long at different little exhibits, but someone who has a shorter attention span might not want to do that. So it's creating those little personalised experiences for them as well. So um, I think you can really do both. Yeah. Does that answer your question? OK, great. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice for uh, developers who, uh, like, is it advisable to put your game forward to multiple different museums, um, depending on uh, the subject matter? Um, Follow-on question for you. What is your sub? If you have a loose subject matter, what is the subject matter? Uh, also, that's, I feel like I put you on the spot. Sorry, don't have to answer that. I, okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, so, for instance, uh, if you're engaged in a game that uh, puts a lot of emphasis on um, historical. Mm. Um, research but for a very niche uh, point in history or a place in history um, would it be would it still be advisable to um, put that game forward to multiple uh, museums as opposed to as opposed to museums who are also in the same kind of niche area that you mm. are yeah uh, first of all that concept rocks <laughs> big historical fan um, it depends on so I mentioned previously, everyone has a collection development policy, so they have to list out exactly what they're looking for. Um, it also depends if they're actually engaging with games or not. For me, what you're saying, like there's a museum called the Chow Chat Wing Museum in Sydney, and they're very much based in ancient cultures and showcasing games from that, or showcasing content from that period. However, I don't see them actively engaging with games. So I guess... The best, I mean, the top three would be who I mentioned previously. And we do have that tripartite of creating a national archive as well. So I, th I think it just, it honestly does depend on the finished product, but you can, um, you can just approach them all. I don't see why not. I go guerrilla mode and just reach out to every single person that I can or feel like they suit best. So I don't think there is a wrong way to go about it unless you feel strongly that, it should not be in a particular museum or gallery. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Hi, Chloe. Hello. Great to meet you. You've got a really cool job, hey? Oh, I know, um, right? 
My name's Beck Rush. Um, I work for the Australian Government in the Office for the Arts, so okay. we look after... Oh, um, you're my... No, you're not my boss, are you? No. No, who's no, not your boss. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So, uh, Ben... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ben, Benny, <laughs> Benny and I um, run the Digital Games Tax Offset Program, so that mm. new offset program, yay. Um, and I just wanted to underscore one of the points that you made um, about the importance of... Um, so I've got a comment and a question. I do have a question. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, in, in the Australian context of um, the cultural importance of games, so with the introduction of the Digital Games Tax Offset, the National Film, Film and Sound Archive, which is the national archive body, um, has the option in legislation to collect um, uh, games, and we've been across the road to have a look at the archive, and it's really incredible uh, what they've what they've got um, already. So, um, I don't think that we're unique globally um, in in that sense, but I think that's a really really strong commitment by the Australian government, and it's also set out in the National Cultural Policy Revive. My question is, how do you not trip over um, other um, collecting institutions? I mean, um, it, it relates to the previous question um, a little bit, because um, often between collecting institutions, there's that tension on, you know, I want that set of photographs from that historical blah, whereas you've got multiple copies here, and you, you talked about you all acquiring a game um, at the same time in the same year. So I'm just mm. curious as to how you manage that kind of hunger games moment. Oh my God. Thank you so much, by the way, for bringing up the National Film and Sound Archive and what they're doing with Screen Australia and collecting. Because I don't work at the NFSA, I didn't want to go too much into it and say something wrong. So um, thank you so much for bringing that up. But that is also another fantastic option. If you do get uh, Screen Australia funding, you can be acquired by the NFSA as well. It's actually in the legislation. You have no choice. Um, <laughs> so. For the Hunger Games moment, um, I mean, the pinnacle, the, the point of it was when we all collected Florence at the same time. I mean, that's when we have to be communicating with each other. And what's great about our tripartite agreement now is that we do communicate with each other. We're all very friendly and we are very conscious about stepping on each other's toes now. Um, one thing, say for, with NFSA, if it does, if a game has been receiving Screen Australia funding, for me... Um, unless I speak to Chris, if it's something that I feel like we could all jointly collaborate on, I wouldn't actually touch that just because I'm like, it will get archived. There's no point in doubling it up. Um, for the powerhouse, so we look at particularly design feats, innovative technologies, as well as uh, very like his social significance, like the COVID collecting that we did. So that's the kind of thing that I'm focusing on in terms of collecting. And then another priority for me is if it's Sydney based as well, uh, for Acme, oh, I don't know if I should speak for Acme, but it's very much just a general general video game. Um, so they have, I mean, they actually have much in their collecting, but they are looking to do, expand on that as well. But just constantly being aware of what everyone is doing and communicating, that's how we avoid Hunger Games style. I like that, Hunger Games. <laughs> but I don't like that. I don't want to compete. It's, <laughs> it's too stressful. I'm already stressed. <laughs> You've got two minutes if you want to ask me another question or bombard me later, it's okay. Also, oh, one question, yes. Oh, wait, wait for the mic. Hi, um, what kind of uh, considerations do you take into exhibiting the games themselves uh, in terms of things like maybe accessibility? Mm. Um, accessibility for me is very key. Um, if it, so uh, with Queer Man Peering, what was great about it was that it was, in terms of the controls, they didn't have to, it was like, you know, like, with like say, like, it was really, like, League of Legends and all that. It's a very, already a barrier visually. Like, even I'm scared to play it because it's just a lot going on, whereas this, it was very much a relaxing experience where you could walk around and you got the story of Queer Man and it was only, what, two buttons that you had to uh, press. So one of my things for accessibility is easy to play for all audiences. Um... I really would love to... So we have also closed captioning for the exhibition as well. And for me, I would love to include other ways of accessibility, but unfortunately, sometimes you're just limited by budget. But if I could have every option for accessibility included into a display, I would. I'm being told to finish. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Um, please feel free to reach out to me.